Moving on to, well, actually, it's a whole range of different things that um, Dig Ventures is involved in. Um, but Dig Ventures is probably um, the best known and most successful crowd funded venture in archaeology that I can think of. Um, and it also branches out into a whole range of other sort of um, community based efforts. Um, and we're lucky to have uh, Maya Pina Dacio. I'm not sure if I'm going to butcher that name, but. Uh, we're lucky to have Maya here today to, uh, to speak on the topic. Yeah, so I just wanted to start, I think, by saying how impressed I am by some of the projects that are going on here and the depth of online engagement that there is. Um, there's been built some really great ways of getting tasks done, um, but I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I'm going to take as my starting point this famous quote um, from Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Um, this is something that people kind of often assume will happen. If you build a platform or you build a thing, people will just appear out of nowhere and start using it. Um, but unless you're Kevin um, with a bunch of dead baseball players in his situation whispering in his ear, please build us a baseball pitch so that we can come back and play, it doesn't actually work like this. The people, yeah, as I said, the people that get involved in these projects don't appear out of nowhere, even though it might sometimes seem like that. Um, there's obviously a great demand for heritage and to be involved. It is, after all, our shared past. But as we heard from Chiara earlier and from some other people as well, there's actually quite a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes into reaching out to communities and getting people involved in the first instance. So none of us want to end up like Kevin, standing in a field with a great platform, but nobody involved. Because that is kind of the problem. You could build the greatest platform for doing the greatest archaeology or heritage project ever, but it's not just the platform that you need to build, it's a community who use it and who will keep using it. So I'm going to talk about just one strand of what Dig Ventures does in this respect, and that's the role of content and communication in building and sustaining communities, and more than that, in scaling them up. Because for us, I know maybe this is a little bit controversial, but actually a good content strategy is one pillar that you can lean on to make sure you don't end up like Kevin here. Um, so for me, it's interesting because I think micropasts and dig ventures are actually, well, we have a lot in common. We're both working in digital social innovation in the heritage sector. Yes, we're doing very, very different things, but we've both built something that is scalable. And in some a social innovation that is scalable is one that is relevant outside its initial context. Not every social innovation is scalable, and that's, that's fine. Some are too specific um, to their location or their context, but I think in, in a lot of respects, for us, what we're doing can be applied and used by lots of different people in lots of different projects. And that's the point that Dig Ventures is at. We're starting to get other people using our processes and systems and changing the way that they're doing archaeology. Um, so for us, you know, content is not only about building that initial court community, but it's going to be something that we use to demonstrate the value of their work, their contribution, their progress, and to make sure that community is sustainable, vibrant, and keeps on growing. So we are going to go out here and make a claim here that we, uh, we were the first um, organisation to crowdfund an archaeology project in the world. I know crowdfunding has, it does have a bit of a legacy, but in, in its current format, doing it online through a crowdfunding platform, um, we were pretty much the first, and that happened about three years ago with the Flagfen project. Um, we are also the only exclusively community-focused archaeology organisation registered with the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. So why crowdfunding for archaeology and what is it all about and why is it different from crowdsourcing? Well, for us, crowdfunding is, well, it's about so much more than raising money. 
it's running a crowdfunding campaign is a great way to bring people to you and to bring you to new people, but that's also really not the end of it. It really changes the relationship between the funder and the researcher. It turns us all into communicators. And the best thing about the crowdfunders is actually that they're really, really demanding. Um, crowdfunding isn't a donation, it's in many ways like crowdsourcing as well. It's a like-for-like -like exchange. People expect after their contribution that there is something coming out of it at the end that they can share with the rest of the world. And what we found really is that people really want to see progress happening at the trial's edge. You know, our, our work is field-based, not online task-based. Um, and people want to see that happening like straight from the trenches. They want to see what we're doing grow and spread and they want to see what they're doing and what they funded being seen by other people and be able to say, oh, that's me, I did that, I helped that happen. Um, and content for us is a really key part of that. Um, so yeah, after three years of crowdfunding, we now actually have a community joining us from all over the world. These are just some of the field venturers from last year. We also have um, an equally large, if not larger, digital online sort of armchair archaeology crew who are sitting watching everything unfold from, from the comfort of their own homes. So just to explain a little bit of background to what we're doing. Um, digital Dig Team is the platform that we've built um, with the help of LPR Archaeology and Heritage Lottery Fund um, and of course our crowdfunders which is a platform for, that communities can use to crowdfund a project and I think most importantly actually record everything that they found online. I don't know how much you know about the archaeological process but context sheet is, is the key thing and that's in most places still done on paper which basically means your files go into a folder and end up in the basement of some archaeology company office and it's really hard to access those files Whereas the way what we're trying to do here is make everything open access from the moment that it's dug up and recorded. So we're literally out there in the field with iPads and our venturers and crowdfunders are using that to record everything, put it online, it gets published straight away. And then all of that is plugged into social media so they can share their finds with their networks. Um, also, anyone who is funding us or digging with us has their own profile on here. So you can click on their happy little faces and see everything that they found, all the comments they've made, all the interpretations, everything that they've contributed to the online archive. It's also a place where people can discuss and find, uh, discuss their finds and results. So again, coming back to this idea of scaling, which I think is roughly where we're all at. Um, scaling is about growing to meet the need that's out there for something to happen to be done. Um, but a social innovation can only scale if what you're doing is superior to the alternatives um, and that always this always sort of involves some sort of interaction between supply and demand which I'm going to come to in a little bit um, but basically finding the people who want to get involved keeping them interested and sharing their contributions I think is key and for us again as I've said before we're doing that using content so these are some of the things that we think about when we're producing content. Firstly, there's a supply and demand, whether that's in terms of you know, which ideas are compelling or which ones are most economically viable, um, what, people, what we want to put out and what people actually want to um, read and consume. Uh, we've also got our spectrum of engagement, so where people start when they see uh, a piece of content and where we hope that they end up. Basically, why, why we're doing all of this and then how we measure our results. So when it comes to supply and demand, this is a bit of a silly way of putting it, but people, there's, there's stuff that people want to read and there's stuff um, that maybe they don't. Um, so supply and demand can sort of be seen at the ideas level, yeah, which ways of doing things are the most compelling, attractive and has the best fit with the needs and aspirations of the people who are going to get involved. Um, or again, in terms of economics, looking at what's being supplied, whether it's effective, whether we're providing it at the right cost and whether there is sufficient demand to take on what we're actually offering. Um, so we need to think about how what we're doing, both in terms of our content and what we're doing, fits into this interaction. Uh, when we come into spectrum of engagement, ours looks a little bit like this. So we start off with people reading, watching, 
giving those sort of single click interactions when they see our content, hopefully then becoming a bit more involved, sharing, retweeting, then maybe asking us questions, getting a little bit involved, ask, um, commenting, giving their ideas and thoughts, and then maybe saying how great everything we're doing seems, and hopefully they do that to the point at which um, they get involved as crowdfunders and potentially come and join us in the trenches, at which point we're helping them learn the skills that they need to contribute to the interpretation of the data that we're digging up. And the ideal outcome for us is that people can then take those skills back to their community archaeology groups and kind of just spread a more sociable way of doing archaeology. Um, so when it came to the question of why content is king, I was just looking at Micropast's Facebook page, which is lovely. And basically this, I think, this sort of sums it up. Someone saw an article, got interested, and carried, carried on. Um, so for us, we find that our content fits into roughly these three categories. You get content that creates these peaks and spikes of interest. You have content that sort of feeds the community. And there's content that's there that maybe it's like SEO orientated and people kind of search and you appear that way. But there is very many different ways to think about content. Uh, we've got to think about where it appears, what format it's in, which channel it's going out through, what its purpose is maybe falling into that, that you know, is it to create a, a spike of activity or is it to kind of feed the existing people that are there and convert them from being initial interested parties to people that are actually getting involved in the projects. Um, so yeah, we do this through a lot of different ways, and I thought what I'd do is just show you some of the some of the things that we're coming out with um, on our blog. Uh, yeah, these are some of the headlines that that we put out, and we really try and think about what makes this content shareable, and what can we also be sharing that helps people learn about the process of archaeology. So, for example, we've got over there on on the right hand side, your left hand side, uh, first aid finds. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a sensationalist way of putting it, but basically we're, what we've done there is we've got um, one of our conservators to write a blog about um, how she conserved the finds that she got, but it's in quite a sort of fun and engaging way, so we're trying to reach out to new people with that. Um, photos, obviously, being in the field with a bunch of archaeologists, you are rich with photo opportunities, and they get shared quite widely, so um, that's something else that we we really enjoy doing. Uh, one of the key things that we do, which I think is quite rare and is kind of tailored towards a quite a specific audience, um, basically the time team crowd, the people that really miss that program and that was, that was something that got a lot, a lot of people interested in archaeology. And I think it was, you know, because it's exposing the way that archaeology is done, you're seeing the archaeologists in the field having a bit of banter, um, trying to interpret what they found. and. This is something that we're trying to do as well. Each day we put out a short five, eight minute video um, and that goes out to all the people that have crowdfunded us. Um, and we're trying to do it in a way, again, kind of quite a community focused way so that it's multivocal. We don't have one authority presenting the finds. People who are digging up their things, it's them that are talking about what they've found on video. Um, Twitter, again, a very interesting channel. Um, you can do an awful lot of different things with it. Um, one of the things that happened when we were in the field that I really enjoyed was the discovery of that golden button over in the corner. Um, we, uh, we put out some pictures and a 3D model of it. Um, we didn't quite know what it was. We, I mean, we were digging on a monastic site and we were kind of like, you know, this place is meant to be austere. What have we got this golden button doing here? And, you know, within... I don't know whether it was 20 minutes or an hour or something, someone had got back to us and said, oh, it's from a 19th century ladies' riding jacket. We've, I've seen one in the v &A just like it. And so from that, we were able to look at, um, look at the context it had come up from and be like, okay, well, that's, that's a context that we now know is, is a lot later and we can modify our day in the field according to that. So it's also a way of bringing information into the trenches and you can really see like, how, much, um, how much knowledge there is out there that are ne not necessarily archaeological experts. Uh, another thing that we do that crosses over, I think, with Micropass is we produce 3D models. And Hugh actually here, I think, is um, 
is there, hello. <laughs> um, it's also one of Micropast's um, most most intense contributors. Um, we've, again, the way that we've been doing it is slightly different. Um, we've been trying to do it so that pretty much from an object being found in a trench, within 24 hours, Hugh has made a beautiful 3D model of it and it's out on the interweb for everyone to see and to be able to play with. So it's, um, it's quite exciting. It's archaeology live in real time. Another thing that we think about when we're producing content is obviously this, this sort of a content cycle that we've got going on. Um, we go through phases of activity. So for us, we've got um, the crowdfunding phase where we're obviously drumming up support, sharing news about what we've done, where we are, what we want to do next. We have chapter two, when we're on site. Um, this is obviously when we're producing a, a lot, a lot of content. Um, and again, it's something that's that's fun and engaging. And if you play around and you and you can enjoy what you're doing, um, and you're not scared of being wrong online, it's actually great. Again, we found uh, a crisp packet on site. It might seem really trivial, um, but some you know we put out we put it on the online recording system. Someone tweeted it out saying, "Oh, it's from the 1980s. We can tell because it's got a Back to the Future three competition on the back." And someone said, no, that means it's from 1990. And that's, you know, within a couple of minutes, you've been corrected. It's great. I love it. So then you have chapter three, uh, post-excavation. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is very field-based, and it can kind of seem like, from a lot of other dig blogs that I've read, as soon as you leave site, that's kind of the end of the news, the end of the story. And that really just isn't the case. There is so much that goes on. Um, afterwards that people are really interested in finding out about. Um, so the post-excavation phase is also really rich. So we have, again, as I've mentioned before, we had Sarah Brown doing her blogs about you know, what it takes to conserve a piece, um, we've got all the different kind of analysis coming out. Um, we've even got you know, venturers tweeting about what they've found. We also have a whole other strand to what we do. Um, I think when it comes to content, one of the key things is that it doesn't all have be about you. There's fun stuff that you can do for the people that are in your community that they enjoy and share and retweet and so on. Um, because archaeology is kind of a lifestyle and people really enjoy it, so we want to share that side of things too. It all sounds like quite a lot of work, I think, and that is something that is really key to bring up um, resourcing. The way that we see it is all this communication and content, it's kind of a bit like managing a really complex trench where each feature is a strand of communication or content that you're producing. And you need to recognize that and resource appropriately. It's not something that we just tag on the end. It is actually, all of this communication is really core to what we do. We're very, very aware that a lot of our crowdfunders aren't with us in the field. They're at home in New Zealand, in India, in Australia, wherever they are, and they want to feel like they're looking over our shoulder at what we do, so this is why it's so important for us to have such a strong content strategy. And I just wanted to point out that Microsoft is doing a lot of great things, and I was absolutely blown away by some of the interactive models and the annotated things. I thought they were really, really great. And I just feel like you know Micropass has plenty of content. Um, you know, it's really rich. There's when I saw um, the Dirk, I saw Hugh tweeting about it, and I saw it. And I <laughs> I was just like, I want to know what this is. I want to play with it. I want to know who found it, how it ended up in this collection, what's what's happening. I want to find out more just because of this little nugget. So I think there is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do around it to engage people and bring new people in and to show off what people have done because the story doesn't end once that's created. There's a lot more to it. So how do we measure success? Well, one of the key things we look at obviously is viewer stats. Um, and I think that graph that I showed you before, you can see that some will produce these spikes and other ones will produce this like steady audience growth. Um, so some people will read one blog, go away, but it will bring lots of new people in. Um, so the key thing that we really have to look at is whether these views actually convert into an action. Obviously for us, that's whether they become crowdfunders or not. But we can also analyze things a bit more deeply and look at whether people that crowdfunded us three years ago are still crowdfunding our campaigns, whether they're still involved, whether they're moving up that spectrum of engagement. 
which we definitely are seeing people do. Um, and yeah, basically these are some of the just an outline of some of the different ways we can measure what's successful. I think sort of covered a bit more by the previous speaker. So just a few takeaway tips if you're looking at producing content to increase your audience and sort of cement your community online. I think the first one really, really is key that it needs to be seen as a key part of any public project and resourced accordingly. Um, you can think creatively about what you've got. <coughs> Remember that each piece has a purpose. You can think about it in terms of whether it's intended to bring new people in, whether it's to train them up, whether it's for them to share and spread the word, whether it's to um, do something else entirely. Um, how do we make it shareable? That's kind of about getting out of your own shoes and looking at what you've got and what you've done that people will think either I did this, I want to tell people about it, or this is really cool, I want to spread it. Um, and something that sort of plugs into that is looking at people with similar interests. Like, so on the fun stuff, for example, I just found out that the Lego community online is massive. There are so many people out there that are really, really, really into Lego. Do a blog on archaeology and Lego, you kind of reach out to a whole new section of people. And we saw like a massive increase in people that are now following us after that. Um, but yeah, again, being field-based archaeologists, we have to plan for peaks and troughs in activity. Um, but a key way to think about that and deal with that is just put your storytellers hat on and think about the fact that the story doesn't end when something is complete. There's a lot to say about how it was created and what's going to happen next to it. Next to it. So that's basically it.